Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. Thank you for the revelation that you're continuing to bring forth. Thank you for the work you're doing in our life. Thank you for the word that comes forth this day. We'll take hold of it, be a doer of it, and see the fruit of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you some important messages most recently. We've talked about obedience in all things. We've also talked about how it's imperative that you set your will to choose to do the Word of God, a life-changing message. We've also talked about how we must get the mind of Christ established in us and how as we get our mind renewed to the precise, correct knowledge of the Word of God, and then we govern our mind by taking our thoughts captive in line with the obedience of Christ, and we make sure that we're obeying the command to think on the right things, we're going to see the mind of Christ established in us, and we will come to the place of being able to think correctly and affect us in all areas of our life, including making the proper choices to do what God expects. Today we're going to talk about another important area, and that is the words of our mouth. The words of your mouth are extremely important, as you will see. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Here, this is speaking about Jesus. And now when he had sat down on the right hand of the majesty, having accomplished everything, it indicates what he was doing all along and what he does even from the position he's in. He's upholding all things by the spoken word, this is the word rhema, which refers to the thing that is spoken, something that's spoken, of his power. And the word power is the word dunamis, which means power. So here it's talking about how the spoken word of his power is how he was bringing all these things to uphold all things. And this word also means really it's translated bring or to bring forth the majority of the times. And so it's talking about how he was also bringing forth all things by the spoken word of his power. So the word has the power of God resident in it, but the way it gets activated is by doing it and also by speaking. Speaking the word puts it in operation. The word is to be spoken. It releases the power that is resident in the word to accomplish what God purposes. This is how Jesus did everything, and that's how you and I are going to do everything as well. We go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 14. It says, The word is very nigh unto thee in thy, <clears throat> in thy mouth, and in thy heart. This is also, this is quoted as you'll see in a moment over in the New Testament, but notice what the Old Testament adds on from this point. The mouth, it's in the mouth and the heart that thou mayest do it. That means as the word is in your heart and the word is in your mouth, in your heart it'll be quickening you and reminding you and, and bringing forth, uh, or talking to you to show you what you're to be doing as well as when it's in your mouth. You speaking, it'll be keep you thinking about it as you're speaking it forth, that you might do it. We need the word in our heart, we need the word in our mouth. As it is, you will be a doer of it consistently in your life. Now we go over to where this is quoted in the New Testament, but some other things are added. In Romans chapter 10, we come to verse 8. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Pointing out that this word now, and it's the rhema, the spoken word, as we mentioned. Same thing about what Jesus spoke to release the power of God. It's in the word. The spoken word of faith which we preach. Showing that the spoken word puts our faith in operation. Now, when you get born again, you get a brand new spirit and a new heart, and you get the faith of Jesus Christ. You have His faith. It's important to realize that now that you have His faith, that you are to put that in operation. And the spoken word of faith 
is the way you're going to work your faith and release the power of God that's resident in the Word of God. The spoken word will go into your, coming into your heart produces faith, and the spoken word that's in your mouth will release faith. One is putting it in, and one is releasing it out. This is why the more that you speak the word, it's putting it in you and also releasing it out so it can carry out uh, what God purposes. That means that the word of God is to be deposited in your heart and is to be released out of your heart by, which is where your faith is, faith is in our heart, and you release it out when you speak it forth with your mouth. This brings us to verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Now we want to stop and talk about this verse for a minute. First of all, this is a verse that many people have said from a standpoint of salvation that this means I'm permanently saved. If I just confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and if I believe in my heart, I shall be saved. This is a future tense verb, and it will be so, it's set. Well, you're going to find that that's not so. Furthermore, there are conditions here that are to be understood. If you confess, this word is a subjunctive mood. If you're here for the first time or just learning these things, we explain everything. The tense voice and mood are extremely important to understand what's being said. The subjunctive mood, whenever there's one of those, it's a conditional statement, and it's important to know that. So this is saying, if you might confess with thy mouth, as Young's brings out, and when it says about the Lord Jesus, the Lord isn't a descriptive thing about Jesus, because the word Lord is a noun, and the word Jesus is also a noun. They're not an adjective what describing it. So it's really saying, if you might confess with your mouth, the Lord, comma, Jesus. Who is the Lord? He's Jesus. Otherwise, you have to confess that He is Lord, and that's Jesus, and He certainly is going to be Lord of your life, evidenced by you walking in line with the Word of God. And you believe in your heart that God did raise Him from the dead, and remember the dead is not talking about physical death. It's talking about out from the dead ones. This is the word for the dead, and it is an adjective, so it would be referring to a dead one, but it's plural, so it's talking about the dead ones. Well, who, who is it, where is that talking about? In hell. Jesus came out of where all the dead ones were, which were in hell. So this is the conditions. If you might confess with your mouth the Lord, Jesus, you believe in your heart God did raise him out of from the dead ones you shall be saved. Now, does that mean it's a done deal forever? Because that looks like you just do it one time. And one of the reasons we would say that, and someone would say that, is because this is what's called an aorist tense, which is usually just a simple, straight statement that is made. And the same thing about the believing over here. So it sounds like if I just did this once, that's it. Well, we have to keep reading, though. For with the heart, man is believing, not just believed one time, is believing. Why do we say that? Because the tense has changed. It's a present tense, meaning continuous, ongoing action. And it's very interesting that this is a peculiar way, of, in some ways, because believing is an active thing that we do, but this is in a passive voice. That means it's not talking about you actively believing, yet it's talking about a present tense ongoing occurrence that's going on in your life. Certainly you are the one believing, but the point is because as a passive voice, it means it's been, a, it's been caused by somebody else which means you would understand this to say with the heart man has come to the believing who has brought you to believing. God has through the word of God that you are hearing and doing because now you've come into relationship with him. Into, this is the word ice, which 
is a preposition referring motion into something, righteousness, meaning with the heart. And what happens with our heart? The word gets in our heart. What is man doing? He's going to be continually believing that because of God bringing that word into the heart that is causing them to come to the place as they respond to it to believe into righteousness. Otherwise, God's result of you having the word in you that you that he worked in you for the believing, it's going to bring you into righteousness because you have to be righteous in order to be saved, remember. And with the mouth, confession, and it says here about confession, same thing, is being made continually. And again, this is still the passive voice, meaning because of God's work in you to bring you to that place. So it's not just you doing it yourself by yourself. It's God's work bringing you to that place into, same thing, ice, salvation. Which means that once saved, always saved statement of verse 9 is not a once saved, always saved statement. It's just talking about how you shall be saved if you met the conditions. And this is clarifying further what's involved. Your heart believing continuously because of God bringing the word into you for you to respond with belief into being righteous. And with your mouth continually confessing. What are you confessing? That Jesus, he is Lord. He has been raised from dead. He is your Lord and Savior. And that is going to bring you into salvation as you continue to declare that and speak that. Which means what? Suppose you quit believing or you quit speaking. Well, you wouldn't be now have met the conditions any longer for being saved. The point being is that salvation initially occurs when you get a brand new spirit, when you have believed and you have confessed Jesus as Lord and you have believed in your heart he's raised from the dead, out of the dead ones. But it's going to be an ongoing work in your life to bring you to righteousness and ongoing of confessing and, and standing and having a relationship ongoingly with him that is going to bring you into salvation because salvation is, we have seen, if you haven't heard our series on it, it is an ongoing process. We are continually being saved by the work of God going on in our life. I thought I would just share that with you so you understand because people have used this as a once saved, always saved type of a teaching, which is not true whatsoever. So, but also it's interesting that it says you confess and when you speak, then you're going to believe because what you are speaking, remember it's coming into your heart, God is working that in you, and that then with the heart, once you have believed, what are you going to do? You're going to respond. It, it switches the order. With the heart now, God bringing you to continually believing into righteousness, what are you going to do? You're going to be then responding by speaking forth, confessing, speaking forth, that's going to what? Bring you into salvation, which is going to be all of the promises of God that has for you. Because salvation, remember, is not just getting born again. It's deliverance, it's healing, it's preservation, it's you're being, uh, seeing all the things that God wants to perform in your life, protect you, all these things. So this is all really showing the ongoing work of God to bring you to being the one who is righteous and one who is in receiving all the salvation that God wants to bring forth in your life, which is all the promises of God, as you will see. Now, Matthew chapter 12 tells us something that's important. We begin with verse 34. He said, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, because they weren't born again, be speaking good things. And again, this is showing that it's expected for you to be speaking ongoingly because it's a present tense, good things. And then he says, out of the abundance of the heart. Well, how do we get this abundance in our heart? It's through whatever we've been hearing or what we've been speaking because it's registering in us. What we hear comes into our heart. What we speak comes into our heart. So out of the abundance of what has come into your heart, the mouth will be speaking. 
So that shows you that the mouth is going to be bringing forth things that have already come into you. What's come into you is so important. That's why you gotta guard your heart and you can't let evil things come into your heart. You wanna guard your heart with all diligence and you wanna get the word of God in you so you don't give place to anything that the enemy would bring into you because that's what's gonna be coming out of your mouth. If we put a tape recorder on your back and, and we're hearing all the things you spoke in the last uh, week or month, what would we hear? Would we hear uh, things that are always gonna be in line with the word or would we hear a bunch of things that uh, we were, wish we wouldn't have said, wouldn't have said or, or sorry we said or we reacted at a particular time and it wasn't the right thing to say or didn't have wisdom. We gotta get the word in us and you want the word filled up in you Remember, we are the water pots that get filled up with the Word of God in us. As that water is filled up with us, then if that's all that's in us, that's going to be in our heart. That's what's going to be coming out of us. And remember, in the New Testament, the Word's written in our heart, and it's written in our mind. So we think correctly, and we have in our heart it produces faith, in our mind it produces hope. And then we're going to bring all those things into being with our mouth speaking forth from what's on the, out of the abundance of our heart. Then he goes on and he says, a good man out of the good treasure or this is the word thesaurus which is where we get our word thesaurus and this is talking about something that's collected what's been collected so because that's what a thesaurus is it's a collection of meanings of particular words a good man uh, and a uh, man out of the good collection of the heart well that's implying you're supposed to be having a good collection in your heart. You're not supposed to be letting evil things come into your heart. If you've been collecting bad things in your heart, you're going to have a lot of bad things coming out. You're not going to be able to bring forth good things because it's out of the good collection of your heart you bring forth good things. But the evil man, out of the evil collection, is going to bring forth evil things. Well, that means whatever you've let in, it's going to be coming out. We've got to make sure that we're guarding our heart with all diligence and learning to only speak what God wants us to speak because not only is it going out to others, but it's coming on the inside of you as well. In fact, we'll come back to this in a moment to show you that that is a true statement we just made. James 1.26, if any man among you seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. In fact, here it means to restrain it, hold it in check, guide it, make sure it's speaking the right things, but deceiveth his own heart. Why would that be? Because of the things he's speaking are coming into his heart. What's going to happen? The man's religion which, or his discipline, his his walk with the Lord, and this is not a bad word, this is a normal word of his, his following his, the, the way of the Lord, it's going to be vain. It's going to be devoid of force, devoid of true success result, useless even of no purpose. Well, that means if we don't get our tongue in line to speak forth right things, we'll be deceiving our heart left and right. And you can't manufacture things out of your heart. It's what comes into your heart of the Word of God that God has sown in and written in your heart, remember, by the Holy Spirit writing in your heart and mind. That is what's going to be brought forth out of you to bring forth salvation, healing, deliverance, all these promises. So our, everything we're doing would be useless and of no purpose. We're going nowhere if we do not get our mind, our, our mouth in order. Matthew chapter 12, we want to go back to now. We saw that if you have a good deposit and good collection of evil of, in your heart, you'll be bringing forth good things because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will be speaking. If you got a bad deposit and bad collection, you'll be bringing forth evil things. We got to clean that up. Then he goes on and says, I say unto you that every not just the evil things that were coming into us would cause us to have judgment, certainly, but now he makes a further statement that every idle word, now when we talk about this word idle, this is a word 
which means inactive or not working. Something that's inactive or not working or not perform the labor, it's shunning the labor that it ought to perform, what it's supposed to perform. Otherwise, and this is talking about the word is rhema here, which means that spoken. So every non-productive, non-working, not producing what it's supposed to be producing, spoken word that men shall speak, they're going to give account thereof in the day of judgment. In other words, your words, you're accountable for them. You're going to see, your words are going to be examined. So every word that's not producing, so it's not just the evil things, but also non-producing words. Because what is your mouth? Your mouth is to be a releaser of the things that God wants for you to put in operation, which is to speak the word and bring his, everything he purposes into being. Your, your mouth is so important. So therefore, we have to make sure that our words are producing. Have your words been producing the things that God wants? We don't want to be speaking from the flesh. We don't want to be speaking out of negativism. We don't want to be speaking from reacting to a situation whatsoever. No. We want to be speaking the things that God wants. He goes on and says, For by thy words you will be justified or you will be shown and declared righteous because your words are righteous. You're speaking right words. And by thy words you'll be condemned. Actually, this is a word, kata, dikazo. This is the word for righteous, and kata means against righteous, meaning your words, if they're found to be against righteousness, what's going to be the result? You're going to be condemned. You're going to have a judgment given against you because of our words. And of course, we just saw that that's what's going to happen because we're going to give account in the day of judgment. So, your words are important. You got to make sure you're getting the right words in you. And you got to also be sure that the words you're speaking are productive, working, speaking, accomplishing what God wants because we are going to be giving account. And if our words are the right words, then we're going to be declared righteous. That means this has to do with you being declared righteous. And if your words are not shown to be righteous, they're against righteousness, then a judgment will be pronounced against us. We will have a judgment against us. This is why your words are so important. And if you're going to go on to perfection, you're going to learn to speak right words. And we are going on to perfection, remember. James chapter 3, verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and also able also to bridle the whole body. Meaning he's going to be able to bridle it, he's going to hold it in check, restrain it, guide it, and where in the direction you should go. So therefore, your words are so important. God wants you to learn to speak right words. Make sure you're not letting the enemy use your mouth for destruction. And make sure you're not speaking words that are non-productive or speaking words that are deceiving your heart so that you don't, you're, you're not in faith anymore. Just because you heard this word, but then you speak these other things, it's now contaminating you on the inside of you because you have a mixed bag, so to speak, put in you and it's, you're not going to have the faith any longer. You're gonna, you can have doubt, you can have wavering, you haven't got this, that which is going to bring forth the release of the power of God in your faith. You've got to speak God's word. <clears throat> now this brings us to another point. You and I have come into covenant relationship when we got born again. The covenant that we have <clears throat> is <clears throat> the words that are declared of which God will do his part of the word and you and I are to do our part of the word. So we've got to learn the word so we know what our responsibilities are and the things that what God will, will do, of course. Now, what this interesting statement here, he's speaking to the wicked here in Psalms 50, verse 16. 
unto the wicked. This would be the ones that are walking in sin or that are not right with God, whether they're born again or whether they're not right, whatever it might be, guilty ones. To the wicked, he says, and he's saying to him, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Can you go and declare his statutes and his, what things he says if you're not right with him? No. Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in your mouth. See, they thought they could just take the covenant in the mouth even though they, weren't, they had all this wickedness in them. No, you can't do it. You gotta be righteous. You're gonna have to have, be right. You can't have, be, have any wickedness or anything evil in you at all whatsoever, be ungodly in any manner. But notice the statement that thou shouldest take my covenant in your mouth, which means they were taking his covenant and they were trying to speak those promises into being with their mouth from the covenant that they had with God. Well, you are supposed to do that, but of course they couldn't do it because they weren't right. And he's, he's saying, well, he coming after them saying, you can't do this. But why ask, that's why he's asking that question of them. Now that brings us though to this point. You are to take the covenant in your mouth in the New Testament. How do I take the covenant in my mouth? I have the word that I'm going to speak forth that is going to bring the promises into being. Why were they wanting to take the covenant in their mouth? So they could bring these things into being. Because they understood you speak things into being. You are going to do the very the same thing. We're going to speak things into being. Now, we must understand that the word that you're going to speak, it is going, you need to be sure that you're speaking words that are spiritual words that are going to release the things of God, because God's word is spirit. John 6, 63. It's the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. You don't want to do anything from the flesh. Remember, the flesh has sin dwelling in it. And you can't, you, anybody that's in the flesh cannot please God whatsoever. The words, rhema, spoken words, the words that are spoken, the spoken words that I speak unto you, what are they? Their spirit and their life, meaning the spoken words that he has spoken to us, they are spirit. They're not fleshly. They're not of the natural. They're spiritual words. They're spiritual according to the ways of the spirit, spiritual law, and they're going to produce life. So that means you and I must get the words from God in us because those spoken words are spirit and you are putting that which is a spirit into operation to bring things into being. That's how you bring everything into being. In fact, we even see over in Hebrews chapter 11. Through faith, verse 3, we understand or perceive with our mind that the not world, this is the word a on the ages it refers to, as Young's brings out, the ages have been prepared or brought into being essentially. This is from this word really mean been put in order or they have been prepared, they have been brought into being. How? By the rhema, spoken word of God. Meaning, how did God do everything? He spoke. And that word released everything that has come into being for in all these different ages. He spoke things into being. Because the word is what he performs. And the way things go, come forth is by them being spoken. So that means what? The spoken word is releasing things. Your mouth's a releaser. What have you been releasing? You got to release the right things. If you've been releasing the wrong things, you're going to be sowing all kinds of evil and it's going to affect you. Whatever you're sowing, you're going to reap. Therefore, we must speak right words. And he goes on, so it's things which are seen in the natural, they weren't made, they didn't, they didn't come to pass from things which do appear. They came to pass from things which do not appear because his words were spirit. And he spoke words of spirit that brought everything into being. That's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to speak spiritual words you're going to bring everything into being, and God's going to perform that 
He's going to bring those things forth in your life as you do what the Word says and speak the Word of God in every situation, which is so important. That brings us to the place of understanding, as it talks about through faith, how are we going to do this now? You're born again. You come into covenant relationship with God. You have a new spirit and a new heart. The Word of God is spirit. The words of the New Testament. Now you get this Word in you and you're going to put it in operation. Well, how can you do it? Because you have the same spirit of faith as He has. We should go over, first of all, to Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. We died, remember, the old spirit's taken out. Now we live, we got a brand new spirit, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That means there's a new you in you. What'd you get? The spirit of Christ. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in a physical body, which I do have, which is still has sin dwelling in it, remember, it hasn't been changed. How do I live? Do I live by my emotions, by my feelings, by my human desires and well, things that are my, my mindset? No. I now live by the faith of the Son of God. Well, if I'm living by the faith of the Son of God, that means I must have the faith of the Son of God. I certainly couldn't live by it if I didn't have it. No, you're now you're going to live by the faith of the Son of God. It is a spirit of faith that we get. And now we go to 2 Corinthians 4.13. We having the same spirit of faith. We all have the same spirit of faith because we all have the same spirit of Christ. Every one of us has Christ in us. And you have the spirit of faith. You have the faith of Jesus Christ. The same spirit of faith. And you're going to put that spirit of faith into operation. It's going to bring everything into being of all the covenant promises that have already been given to you and to govern every situation through the Word of God just like Jesus was upholding all things. He was bringing into being all things by the spoken Word. That's the way you're going to do things as well. This is why you, what you speak out of your mouth is critical. If you just, just run at the mouth and you're just all, all over the place, no wonder you're not seeing anything happen. You got to make sure your mouth is only speaking right things. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Where it talks about this, this as it's according to written, say, what's this all talking about, about something being written? Well, it's back in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, Psalms 116. He's speaking about something he's quoting from back there, but then he adds to it about the New Testament application, which we'll point out in just a second. Psalms 116.10, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. That means he spoke, he believed, and he's spoken, declaring that he did this in a one-time aspect. Well, let's go back and see what all it's saying in 2 Corinthians 4.13. He's quoting this, I believe, therefore have I spoken. Great. Well, does that mean I just do the th same thing? Speak one time and believe, believe, and then speak one time and that's it? No. Now, he's pointing out what we do in the New Testament era. We also not believed as it was over here, but instead, now, we are continually believing ongoingly now in the New Testament and therefore what are we doing? We are speaking and what are we believing? The Word in our heart continually and what are we doing? We're speaking continually with our mouth and why is that? Because that's putting our faith in operation. This also shows that your mouth is to be continually speaking forth and of course, you're to be continually believing. You can't get in doubt and unbelief or wavering or, or back off or, or stop speaking or stop believing. You're going to affect things. As you believe and you speak continuously, you will see your faith continually be put in operation to bring things into being. 
This is why we speak continuously. This is why we pray without ceasing. This is why we cast out continually. This is why everything that we do is ongoingly in the New Testament to continually put the power of God and bring these promises into being as we speak the word, which is going to be governing everything. That's how Jesus controlled everything. That's how he brought everything into being. And that's the way you're gonna do it too. That's why we must understand your mouth is a releaser. It's also a depositor of what is going in. That's why as you speak the word, it's coming into you. And as you speak the word, it's going out and it's doing something. It's releasing as long as you're speaking the right thing. Now, here's another point. Philemon, verse 6, very interesting what it says here. It says that the communication, this is the word koinonia, which refers to, in some ways, sometimes it can refer to fellowship, but it also can refer to something that is a participation. You're being a participant. It's the participation of your faith when it says about becoming, it might become, meaning this is a conditional statement now, active and operative. This is effectuals, not bad, but it's the word energase, which means active and operative, essentially. Actively operating, probably be, or Young's brings it out, working. The participation of your faith, if conditions are met, might become actively operating, and what's going to be one of the conditions, the things it says after that, in the not acknowledging, that would be a participle and speaking something forth. No, it's not talking about that. Why do I say that? If this was acknowledging, it'd have to be a participle in the Greek. It's not. It is a word that is a noun. Here it is. It is a noun. So we're not going to translate it with an ing. It's a mistake. Instead, the participation of your faith might become actively operative in the what? Precise, correct knowledge. Meaning, the way it's going to be operative is when you have the precise, correct knowledge that you are speaking for to put in operation. You got to be speaking accurately in line with the word. You can't be speaking something you think, but it's off track. It's not going to produce anything. The precise, correct knowledge of every good thing that's in you. And what is that? All the promises of God that have been given to you. Remember, we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In fact, we'll come back here for a moment. Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us. That's past tense. With what? All spiritual blessings. They already belong to us. In the heavenlies, because where is this document kept? In heaven, which now you and I are born from heaven, and we are operating according to the way of heaven. And it says, in Christ, because you are now in Christ, that means all these blessings are in you and they belong to you in Christ. And you are to see these be brought into being. So what we see over here in Philemon verse 6, the participation of your faith might become actively operative in the precise, correct knowledge of every good thing that's in you, everything that's in you, all these promises, all the blessings, they're already yours. But then there's a very interesting thing that happens after this. Instead of saying, in Christ Jesus here, which is usually the word en, if you notice it below, it's different. Ice, into. That means motion into Christ Jesus. Meaning, as you are putting your faith in operation, 
active operation in the precise correct knowledge of every good thing that's in you, all these things you're speaking to being and taking hold of with your faith, all the promises, it's going to bring you into Christ Jesus. Now, you're already in Christ in the fact that you have a new spirit, but this is talking about something different. It's going to bring you into Christ Jesus, which means you're going to become like Him. And we'll show you why that's so when we look at another scripture that's uh, somewhat parallel to this. Otherwise, understanding what's really being said is important. You have to look up every word, that's for sure. Look what it says here in, in 2 Peter. In fact, we'll back up a couple verses. Grace and peace. God desires to be multiplied unto you. How? In the precise correct knowledge, again, we got to get the word exactly, of God and Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power, and where's the power? In the word, has given unto us all things, we have all the promises have already been given to us, remember, we've all been, already been blessed with all these spiritual blessings that pertain unto life and godliness, everything you have need of, it's been already given to you through the promises. And this says through, how? Again, the precise, correct knowledge of Him, which you've got to get, and we talked about that, who's called us to glory, the manifest presence of God, and to virtue, moral excellence. And then he goes on, says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Well, these are all the promises that we are to take hold of and see all the spiritual blessings come into manifestation in our life. We have the exceeding great and precious promises, and how are we going to know them? Through the Word of God, the precise, correct knowledge of God. All the blessings are ours. All the promises are ours. In fact, let's back up for a second and show you the Scripture, just so you understand this clearly when we talk about promises. 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God in Him, you and I are in Him, are, yes, and in Him, so be it, that's it, it's set unto the glory of God by us, meaning all the promises all have been given to us. Therefore, now look what it says here with this knowledge of God, precise, correct knowledge of God is given to us everything for life and godliness. The, he's given unto us and when he talks about having given this unto us, this is, again, showing that it's already been given because it's a perfect tense. It's been given to us in the past with present results in the past, and it's ours today by God because it's passive voice, meaning you didn't do it to anything. God did it. Exceeding great and precious promises, all those promises that we are to possess and notice that by these you might become, get am I, partakers, and this is this a form of the word koinonia that we saw over there in Philemon 1.6, where it talked about the participation. Well, this is the same thing as the participation or the one who's the partner or actually the partaker is a better way to think of it in this sense that we might become partakers of the divine nature. In other words, as you put your faith in operation, active operation, according to all the promises that have been given to you with the precise, correct knowledge of God, they're all in you in Christ Jesus, what's it going to produce as you're possessing these promises? You're going to become a partaker of the divine nature, which means you're going to become like Him. The same thing it said over in Philemon when it said that you come into Christ Jesus, you are now coming into becoming like Him. Meaning, as you possess the promises, as you possess all the blessings through the precise correct knowledge of God, with your faith actively being put in operation, the exceeding great and precious promises that you, part, you part, possess, you are becoming like Him. Meaning, you want to come to the place of becoming like Him in perfection? You're going to possess the promises. You're to possess all the promises. Because all the promises are not just giving you things. They're doing a total work in you to make you like Him. You're going to become like 
him. So, the participation of your faith to become actively operative in precise, correct knowledge of every good thing that's in you as a believer in Christ, all these promises given to you will bring you into Jesus Christ to become a partaker of the divine nature, becoming like him. That's what those two verses say. So it's not just trying to possess something for what I have need of. It's the total work. Because the partaker of the divine nature, that's becoming like him. Because you are going to become like him. You and I are going on to perfection. You must understand God is going to do a total work in this end time church to bring it to perfection and to bring it to be the glorious church that he's going to pour out. Remember, the glory of God's only going to be poured out on those who have met the conditions. And we are going on into perfection. And this means our mouth has to come in line, in order with the word of God. We go back to Exodus chapter 4 and we see something important. Verse 15. He said, Thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. God will put words, it said, in his mouth, and because his words, God's words were in his mouth, he's going to be with your mouth. Because what are you going to do with the words in your mouth? You're going to be speaking them. It means God's going to be with the words that you're speaking with as long as there is His words in your mouth. Now, if you're speaking other words, He's not going to be with your, with your mouth. He's with your mouth only when you're speaking His words. So you, but another reason why you've got to be speaking right words so that He can then be with your mouth. He's not with your mouth automatically. He's only with your mouth if the right words are in you and coming out of you. That's essential. Second Samuel, chapter 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. Remember, the Holy Spirit is going to be working through you to bring these things forth. And his word was in my tongue. So as you speak, you're releasing the Spirit. Remember, you're speaking words of Spirit and you're putting Him in operation because God's the one who's going to do it, not you. And He is the Word. So you're spe we speak the Word. That's putting the Spirit of the Lord in operation. And He's going to speak by you. You're the vessel. Well, I'm waiting for God to do something. No, He's waiting for you to speak to put Him in operation. He spake by me. God's going to speak by you and me. Only when his word is in my mouth coming out of me. He's not going to speak by you if you aren't speaking right words. In fact, you can be letting the devil speak in you and through you. And you can be a vessel of destruction. You, gotta be speak you can be sowing evil things in you. You can be putting doubt on you. You can be speaking all these terrible things, poor old me, like nothing's working out, and then on and on, speaking negatives. Now, how's that helping you? You're just shutting God down. That's not the Holy Spirit. If anything, you'll be taking devils into you, and they'll be then working at you continually. Your mouth is important. The Spirit of the Lord will speak by you when His Word is in your mouth. It is absolutely essential. Words are carriers. Words are releasers. Words are depositing things in you. They're coming into you. And remember, the words are, they're alive and they're, they're going active operation. In fact, you understand now more so what Hebrews is talking about, 4.12. The Word of God is living and alive. This is the word living. And we already saw this word, energase. It's active and operative, actively operative. The Word of God is living. It's alive. It is a living thing that you are, if, if it's the true Word of God, you're speaking. And it's actively operative. How? When you, of course, are speaking it and putting it in operation whenever it's going forth in some way. And notice it talks about sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, which really means penetrating. 
It's penetrating through to anything. Nothing can stop it. It'll divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word will get into everything. The Word of God penetrates everything. That's why you need to speak the Word of God to people if you want to get through to them. Don't speak your opinions. Don't try to just ramble around. Speak the Word of God. And that Word will get into their heart and mind. It will penetrate. It doesn't matter what they want to do. It will go in. They may kick it out, but nonetheless, it's going in. That's why you need to always speak the Word. It is living. It is full of power. We already know that from dunamis, but here it's not talking about power. It is actively operating. you got to know that. So when you speak the Word, it's alive. This is a living thing that's going out of me. And this is actively operating, going out of me. It's doing something. you got to know that. So anytime you speak, don't you think, well, I wonder if anything happened. Well, I hope somebody heard me. I hope it, hope it had some effect. You aren't understanding yet. you got to know and believe. It is actively operating. It is going forth. And it's penetrating where you're speaking it. And nothing's going to stop it. God's Word will bring things into being. And you've got to understand what God will do. Isaiah, chapter 57. When you speak this Word that's alive, that's living, that will be actively operative. Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 19. I create, or as Young's brings out, producing the fruit of the lips. That's right. And when it talks about him create here, this is participle active, which is like the present tense in the Greek, meaning I am creating or I am producing or I am bringing into being the fruit of the lips. Because remember, the Spirit of the Lord spake by you because His Word was in you. So what's happening when He is speaking through you? He's doing something. He is creating, He is producing the fruit of your lips because of what's coming out. Well, that also shows you. I've got to have the right things coming out of my mouth. If I don't have the right things coming out of my mouth, God can't do anything. You know, that old religious false teachings that think that, well, God's in control of everything, you know, whatever God wants, you know. And he's waiting on us. He wants us to get the Word in. And He wants us to speak to put Him in operation and know that it's alive and it's actively operating and that He is producing it and creating the things that you speak. Just like Jesus understood all that, and that's why he was speaking, upholding, and bringing into being everything through the spoken word of his power. That is what God wants you to understand. Now, your words are important. Because you can't, well, I, sorry I said that, I want to take that back. It doesn't work. Once words go... They're out there and they're doing something. The words are have an effect. Here shows you the proof of it. Genesis chapter 27. Remember Esau, Jacob, Isaac is going to pronounce this blessing upon them. And what did he do? He told to go out there and get this venison and feed me before I pronounce this blessing upon you. Well, here, remember Jacob. He went out, he, his mother went and cooked this up for him and got this done beforehand and had him like he was Esau. Genesis 27, 27, he came near, kissed him, and smelled the smell of his raiment, blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field, which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee. Nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. And let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone, everyone that curseth thee. And blessed be he that blesseth thee. He pronounced the blessing on Jacob. 
So the words went forth and the blessing was released. Well, what happened a little bit later? Verse 33. This is when Esau comes in and speaks to his father, and I've got your venison, so your soul may bless me. And Isaac said, who are you? He said, I am my son, my firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very succeedingly and said, Who, where is he that hath taken the venison, brought it to me, and I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him? And he shall be blessed. I mean, couldn't you just say, Sorry, I'm taking that back. That was the wrong thing to do. Nope. Once the words were released, they had effect. It was pronounced. It set. He shall be blessed. Otherwise, he couldn't stop what had already been released. You've got to understand your words are important. Look at Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. Be slow, be sure what you're saying is the right thing. For God's in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. I mean, what you speak has got to count. So you're not going to be rambling forever, that's for sure. You're going to be speaking what God wants you to speak. And then we come down here to verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Your mouth can cause your flesh to sin because you spoke not spiritual words in line with the word. You spoke from the flesh or you spoke from the natural or you spoke from your own thoughts or you spoke from your own reactions or whatever. You cause yourself to sin with your mouth. Your mouth can cause you to sin, your flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an heir. Oh, it was an angel. An heir was, an angel was an heir. I want to take that back. It doesn't work. It already went forth. What went forth as he had activated the angel, but if you spoke the wrong things, it shut him down. He can't do anything because you spoke the wrong words. And also, we'll put demons in operation, of course. Ah, they'll come on the scene to be working. That's why they want to get to your mouth, see, and your words. You can't just say it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? As a judgment. Meaning, you can destroy the work of your hands or see it be accomplished because you spoke wrong words. You may have had good intention. You may have done a lot of things. You turn around and speak the wrong things. You can destroy the things that you have wrought. We've got to be sure that we're only speaking right words. And this is why you've got to let the Lord be Lord, truly Lord in your life. Psalms 12, verse 3. The Lord will cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Don't be speaking proud things. Those words you're going to just be judged for. That's a bunch of I, 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 me, 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 and all out of, out of self reacting. Who have said, why do they do this? With our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who's Lord over us? Jesus is Lord over the whole being because he bought the whole being. He just doesn't have control as far as purchasing wise, bought your spirit. No, he bought the whole deal. And your lips are not your own. You say, well, how do, how do, how do you know that? Because of the everything, how do we know anything? Because of the word. And if you don't have the word for it, you don't know anything. <laughs> First Corinthians 6.20 You are bought with a price. 
Was that just my spirit? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The whole deal is God's. Your body is God's, even though it hasn't been changed yet. But it's going to be. We're going to get a new body when he comes back and we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be changed. But the present time, we have that's why we're, what are we supposed to do? Present our body holy, you know, unto, uh, unto the Lord, even though it has sin dwelling in it. Your body is not your own. Therefore, can you just speak whatever you want? No. You must yield your lips to him. You got to make him lord over your mouth. That means you just don't go blurting out whatever you think. You can't be speaking all kinds of negative stuff. You can't be rude and unmannerly and sharp and kind of mean and short with people and, you know, give them a piece of your mind and be critical and judgmental and negative and backbiting and putting people down, can, all this kind of stuff. No way. What do we do? We give people what they have need of, don't we? We always speak the word of God. and We give them love. We bless them. We do speak what they need to. Because remember, everything you speak is releasing something. And it's penetrating. You speak what they have need of. It's going into them. You can't be the judge. God didn't come to destroy people. He came to save people. And he wants you to speak the right thing so he operates through you to get them to that place of being saved. You've got to speak right words. Your lips are not your own. We present our lips, our mind, totally unto you. We declare they are not ours Remember, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. My body's a living sacrifice. That includes my mind. It's also, we've talked about all your members, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing. My whole being has got to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. But you've got to present it. You present it to him. You yield to him. You give it. You make it his because he already purchased it. Otherwise, you're responding to the fact that he bought you because you're going to present your body a living sacrifice. We got to get our mouth speaking right words. That's how God's going to be put in operation. That's how you're going to see God work in you to bring you to perfection and possess all the promises. That's how you're going to not be causing your flesh to sin because you're going to speak right words. And you're not going to be destructive to anybody because you're going to always speak the right things. Teach me and I will hold my tongue. That's right. So you only speak the right things. And cause me to understand where I've erred. Oh, he will. You got to learn to hold your tongue. When something goes on, stuff, you, what's the first thing? Your mouth just wants to just blurt it out, you know? No. I'm holding that tongue. I'm not letting that thing have control. No way. Then he says, how forcible are right words. And it's interesting in this sense, because it's a nefal sim, this word is trans actually means grievous or painful. What it's essentially saying is what, how, what kind of, an, it's, it's a, how effective. And this would be in a negative sense. Of course, how negative would be, grievous or painful would be wrong words. But the word is used in a sense showing that the opposite is of effect, but still the intense effect is when you speak right words. How forceful and powerful and effective are right words. You've got to speak right words. 
Your words are powerful and they'll be effective if you're the right words. They got to be upright words. They got to be in line with the Word of God, right? We got to speak right words. So we must put the words, the right words in us and speak right words and know they are forceful, they are effective, they are powerful, they are doing something. Samuel was one who was in the presence of God. And he was one who was used tremendously as a prophet of God. And here is the testimony about him. 1 Samuel 3.19, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. That meant they all produced results. Well, that means he had to be speaking the right words all the time. That also tells you if you're speaking words that are not right words, they're just falling to the ground. Or they could be damaging people or let dev devils operate through you and be damaging someone else. And also remember they're sowing evil things in you at the same time. It has multiple effects. But this is essentially saying of the words he spoke, they were all productive and they were all producing results. They didn't just fall to the ground and nothing happened. Your words are to cause things to happen. God wants you to speak right words. Why was it that he didn't let none of his words fall to the ground? The Lord was with him, and why was that? Because remember, who's the Lord with? The one who's speaking his words. I'll put my words in your mouth, and I'll be with you, your mouth. That's right. It's because you have the words in you. That's why the Lord's with your mouth and with you. And none of his words fell to the ground. They came to pass. Are your words bringing things to pass? I spoke a lot of words and haven't seen things happen. Um, are we speaking the right words? Or have we sown a lot of other, oh, we spoke right words one minute and then turned around and spoke negative words the next minute and undid what we just did, started and shut down? All oh, the angels started going and all of a sudden, whoops, <laughs> we can't do anything because he quit speaking the right words. We can't be doing that. You've got to understand, you can put life in operation, but you can also put death in operation. Proverbs 18, verse 20 and 21. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. You're going to have the fruit of your mouth, whether you like it or not. And with the increase, or the production, the pro produce, more really what it says, this is really talking about the produce of his lips shall he be filled. Otherwise, whatever they're producing. The production of your mouth you're being filled with and you're going to be satisfied whether you like it or not. <laughs> because that's the way things work. Words are carriers. Words are releasers. Words are putting things in operation. And words you can't speak and then take them back and say, oh, I don't, want, I don't mean that. Once they're out, they're out. They're doing something. And of course, then it goes on. It says death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can release death or you can release life. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You've got to learn to speak life. Remember, his words are spirit and they're life. He wants you to speak life. Don't speak the negatives. Don't speak your problem. That's why, do we pray our problem? Never. You pray the answer. It all makes all the sense. Why would I pray the problem? Well, if that's putting negatives out, I'm not going to get anywhere. My, those words are going to fall to the ground and go nowhere. <laughs> you speak the answer, which is what? It's putting God in operation. And God will be with your mouth because you spoke the right words. God wants you to learn to speak right words at all times. Now, if you speak wrong words, you do have to understand the enemy is going to get you. Proverbs 6, 2. Thou art snared with the words of your mouth, and you are captured, is the better understanding of this, with the words of your mouth. You can be snared in bondage, 
and you can be captured by the enemy because of the words of your mouth. And of course, who does that? The devil. And then how, what does the devil do? The demons have come into you. And then when the demons are in you, the more demons are in you, the stronger they are and the more effect they have. That's why you've got to cast those demons out. But remember, if you don't correct your problem and get things in order, <laughs> you cast them out, it's not going to produce the results if you are continuing to do the same thing. Remember, the guy that got healed, Jesus said, he found him and said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come on you. And remember what happens when you cast out demons, if you don't fill yourself up with the word and do what's right and correct the problems, seven more wicked will come in and you'll be worse than you were in the first. So casting out demons is important to get rid of all these spirits that have come in, but you have to cut it off. We cannot be thinking we're going to cast out anger spirits and then you're letting anger continually happen, you're going to be getting worse. Or fear, and you keep yielding to fear, or anxiety, and you don't take your thoughts captive and obey the word that says, be anxious for nothing and cast every care upon the Lord. Whatever it is, you've got to correct it. That's why you hear me say it at every <coughs> deliverance session, at the end of that, when we're praying that prayer, we're thanking him for delivering us and continuing to do that, but also we're correcting everything. We have to correct everything. Otherwise, the enemies are coming back. We're going to be taken captured. God doesn't want you to be captured. He wants you to get set free. Deliverance brings forth freedom. But without someone knowing what's necessary and being right with God and what's necessary to retain their deliverance, they will go nowhere. In fact, they will get worse. And we've seen that happen for years and years with people who just wanted to get free of their problem, but not let Jesus have his total way in their life and change and accomplish what he purposes. The person just, you can tell, you can't approach deliverance with a selfish attitude. It's got to be what God wants. He wants everything out and he wants everything restored and he wants everything uh, change your mind and, and deal with everything in our life. Psalms 39, verse 1. I said, I will take heed, guard my ways, but I sin not with my tongue. We've got to guard ourselves. We can't be sinning with our tongue. Of course, that does, that's not putting God in operation. What happens when we sin with our tongue? We're putting the devil in operation. <laughs> the devil can use you to bring destruction. You can speak negatives to people and you are actually a vessel of the devil to sow evil into them because death and the life are in the power of the tongue. I will guard, shamar, my mouth with a bridle. Actually, this is the word that means a muzzle. I'm just going to not a bridle, a muzzle. Do you need a muzzle for a while? <laughs> Some people do. Zip it for a while? <laughs> Do you learn to speak the right things? And he says, while the wicked's before me, of course, which are the enemies, and of course, this is definitely important when the, you think because the, if the devil's before you. But is he before you? He, of course he is, all the time, because if your eyes are open to the realm of the Spirit, there's angels and demons all over the place. They're just looking for an opportunity to get to you. They're listening. They're watching for you to give place to them. I think we need a muzzle for a while, maybe. Especially if we start speaking the wrong things. Oop, get that muzzle on. I got to shut this down. I can't let myself be get, putting out death and bringing destruction upon me and so forth. No way. We got to come in line. Psalms 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And it's not just the words of your mouth, but the meditation of your heart, because your heart's got to be right. Remember, remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means the production in your heart is very important. You've got to get this word in your heart. This is why you've got to guard your heart. Remember what it says over in Proverbs chapter 4? 
talks about watch over, not czar, your heart with all diligence is not a good uh, uh, translation here because it's the word that means like a guard, like a guard post. Or like a, someone is a prison uh, guarding the house, like it shows. Watch over your heart like a guard house. I'm guarding my heart. Because remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. So I can't let any evils come into my heart. And what's all the entrance into your heart? All your members. What you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're thinking, what you're speaking, you can deceive your own heart, what you're doing, your actions, all your members, all your faculties. For out of it are the outgoings of life. Well, that's a good statement because what's supposed to be coming out of our heart? The outgoings of life because of the word in our heart, it's supposed to be coming out bringing life. So if we don't watch over our heart like a prison house, a guard over a house, a guard of a house, guarding our house, we're going to be in trouble. We can't have all this evil stuff coming into us. In fact, he went back, back here, he said, but talked about getting the word in you, remember? My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Would I want to hear anything that's not pour, pouring the word into me? No. Let them not depart from mine eyes. Don't be watching any of that stuff that's filthy, secular stuff in this world. It's contaminating you, sowing evil in you. Guard them, shamar, in the midst of thine heart. Well, that's because they got in your heart because they got sown in your heart. You've got to keep them in your heart. You've got to watch over and not let the devil get to you. And see, of course, what does the devil try to do when you hear the word? He's going to come to try to take it out of your heart. Remember the parable of the sower? Mark 4, 15. These are by the wayside where the word is sown. When they've heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. You heard it? The devil's on the attack to get the word in you. You have to believe it. Take hold of it. Incorporate it in your lifestyle. Act upon it not do anything contrary to it, otherwise the devil can get it out. And of course, he's trying to get to you. He wants you definitely to speak wrong words and wrong thoughts. And we talked about the wrong thoughts. But here in Psalms 56, you got to understand spiritual reality. First of all, Psalms 56, 2. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. The devils don't take a vacation. They're looking every day to get to you. And there aren't just a few. There be many that fight against me, O though most high. But it doesn't matter how many, because you have authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can conquer them all. You have angels that will go into operation sufficient number to conquer anything and everything that comes against you. That's why Jesus said, well, I could pray to my Father. He could you know, give these legions, 12 legions of angels, enough that would deal with a situation. You can pray, and God will bring them on the scene to deal with whatever situation you're dealing with. There's lots of enemies, though, against you. Now, he goes on to verse 5, and it says, every day. Not just once in a while. Every day. They rest my words. They're trying to get to your words. They're trying to turn your words, twist your words, vex you, hurt you, somehow get you off track with your words. And all their thoughts are against you for evil. This is why it's mandatory for you to govern your mind. And also, you can't let him get to your words. The devils are trying to get to your words. They don't want you to speak right words. And they want you, they want, you want, they want you to speak the wrong words. React to the situation. Speak that negative. Be, point out that guy's faults. You know. Get angry about that. Give him a piece of your mind. You know. Speak the negative thing. 
No. <laughs> We're to be slow to speak, remember. Not ready to just blurt out. Not be a reactor. The devil is trying to get to your words. You've got to guard them. And your thought, his thoughts, of course, against you are for evil. So what are we going to do? We're going to purpose that we're not going to sin with our mouth anymore. Psalm 17, 3. Thou hast proved my heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. Oh, that's a good report. I am purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. That's right. You purpose that your mouth's not going to transgress. He won't find any negatives in you when he tries you and tests you as well. But we do have to purpose, just like we've talked about. You've got to set your will. You're going to choose to do the will of God. That's it. You're going to take every thought captive and bring it into obedience to Christ. You're going to have a ready, prepared and ready to revenge the disobedient thoughts that are coming at you when your obedience is fulfilled. And you're going to obey the command to think on the things that are right and good things in the sight of the Lord. You're going to guard your mind. You're going to make sure your mind is thinking right. You're going to guard your heart, as we've seen. And you're going to purpose that your mouth will not transgress. If that means you have to put a muzzle on, put a muzzle on. Do whatever you got to do. If we see you coming in here with a piece of tape over your mouth, we understand where you are. We won't be thinking you're crazy. We'll understand, okay, you're, you're trying to get things in order here. Yeah. <laughs> Psalms 141. Verse 3. Set a watch, guard, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door, guard the door of my lips. Because remember, your lips are releasing something. You've got to guard. Can't let anything get to you. You've got to guard. Set a watch. Now, of course, at the same time, all the enemies are trying to come against you. I mean, they're already trying to get to your thoughts. But they'll also speak against you. What are you going to do about that? Lamentations 3, verse 46. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. They'll criticize you. They'll be negative against you. The devil will use people to try to speak negative things against you, to put you down or to get you off course. You don't retaliate. You don't try to put them in their place. You don't speak negatives and, and fight fire with fire. No way. You give them what they have need of. You speak the right thing. They open their mouths against you. It's all about people being used to the devil. Now, if you're talking about the devil's coming against you, you're going to speak the word. How did Jesus conquer the attacks that came against him? In the temptation, what did he say? He gave the answer. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every time it's written, it's written, it's written. He gave the answer. He didn't jump after the enemy and try to deride him or speak that in negative stuff. No. He just spoke the answer. That's all you need to do. Remember, the Word of God is powerful, active, operative, penetrating through anything that comes at you. You're going to speak forth the Word. It is written. And how about people that speak something against you? Well, you've got to deal with it properly. If you don't deal with it properly, it can get to you. Look what happened here. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 10, here's Goliath the Philistine. He said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. <coughs> well, how did these words, or the, how were they handled by the Israelites? When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. 
The enemy's words sowed the negatives in him, dismay and great fear. You can't let that come into you. David heard the same words. He didn't respond negatively. He, heard, he, 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 he found out about all these things. He, remember, he's the one who came up and uh, we come farther up. When the words were heard which David spake, of course they rehearsed them before Saul, he said, let no man's heart fail because of them. Otherwise, he didn't respond to it in that negative way. He responded to it, what's the answer? My servant will go and fight with this Philistine. We'll take this on. We're going to enter into the warfare and conquer. You don't let it affect you adversely. You conquer. You get on the offensive and go after the enemies, and which is exactly what he did, and they got destroyed. And you can't let these words get to you and try to wear you down. The devil will try to barrage you with things and get you to wear, be worn down. Judges 16, 16. This is about Samson and Delilah. It came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Then he told her all his heart and told him what the source of his strength was. You can't let the devil get to you daily. And you definitely have to watch your thoughts so you don't take it and memory recall the past things and you revolve it around the mind 50 times thinking about the same thing that they did and keep, keep it alive in you continually. No. You cast that down. You pray and speak the word and that's it. Don't sit there and think about it for the next 10 days in a row and wallow in it. You're going to let memory recall spirits just pour into you. And they will. That's why we got to guard ourselves and not let the enemy at place. And you think that the words don't have effect. They do. Because remember, words have power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Job 19.2 How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Or to crush me and bruise me and damage me? It will affect you. Again, remember that crazy nursery rhyme. It says, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Words will destroy you. They'll destroy you. They'll vex you. You need to deal with those words. What am I going to do? I'm going to speak the word of God. That's the truth. And what else am I going to do? Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 17. Look what it says. No weapon that's formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, you shall condemn it. You cast it down. You condemn that tongue. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and they're righteousness of me. Otherwise, you're not going to let it penetrate. You're going to condemn that. You're going to speak the word. You're going to do the things that God wants you to speak. And you've got to get your mouth in operation. Because look at this statement here. This is what Hannah learned to do because she had, they were speaking against her because she was barren. Remember? 1 Samuel 2 1. Samuel, Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoice in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Your mouth needs to be enlarged over your enemies. And notice what else was the key. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. She wasn't going to be moved by all the criticism. She's got her eyes on what God's going to do. You get your eyes on the promise of what God will do. She knew where she was headed. To see the promise come to pass. But you've got to get your mouth enlarged over your enemies. You can't let them take you down. You can't sink get depressed, get down. All the negatives that might come at you, they're designed to pull you down somehow. 
Your mouth is to be enlarged over your enemies because you're going to speak what the Word says. And you're going to rejoice in the promise of God. You're not going to be moved by anything that anybody says whatsoever. You're going to do the right things. God wants us to understand. A couple more scriptures. I know we're going on a little bit, but such an important message. Psalms 45. And if you're aware of that song we sing my, about our words, it's got tremendous powerful things in it. And this is where part of it comes from. Psalms 45, verse 1. My heart's indicted in a good matter. I speak of the things which I've made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Your tongue is writing things in the spirit. Thou art fair in the children of men. Grace is poured into my lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. You pour the right words in, you're going to see the blessings. But if you pour the wrong words in, you could bring curses upon you or give place to the enemy. You've got to speak right words. It's so important. And look at this scripture. This is a powerful scripture to understand of what we should be doing and speaking right things. Proverbs 11, 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. We're to speak blessing. We're to speak what we have need of in the city, in the state, in the nation. But it's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked, or the ones who are speaking wrong things. Remember, the mouths are releasers. So we condemn every tongue that is speaking evil things against the city, the state, and the nation in the name of Jesus. All their evil words, we condemn them and cast them down in the name of Jesus. And we speak blessing of what God wants, which is to bring the people to come to turn towards God. You speak the right things, the blessing of the upright. The ones who know what to speak, the righteous ones, the city will be exalted. It affects a city. It'll affect a state, it'll affect a nation. If you can just get everybody on board, Most everybody out there, 99 plus percent, are all negative about everything. And all they do is want to speak all the negatives about what's going on. We're aware of the negatives, but we're speaking the blessings into being. We're not going to be a part of the wicked overthrowing everything by speaking all the negatives. It's not going to do any good. We're going to bind, we're going to loose, we're going to cast out, we're going to throw down. We're going to speak into being what needs to be. Your mouth is a releaser. Your mouth can put the power of God in operation. We got to do the right things with our mouth. This is a life-changing message. I trust you're thinking about all the words that you've been speaking throughout this. And you're realizing I got to get this word in my heart in abundance. I got to be guarding myself. I got to make sure that I'm only speaking right words so I put God in operation so he'll be with my mouth. And I got to, I may need a muscle, whatever I need to do, I got to get it in order. Only right things. You do, you hearken unto this message, you're on your way to becoming like Jesus and to see all the promises come to pass and be righteous and proved before God and be a vessel for God to flow through and you'll have tremendous blessings coming forth in your life if you speak the right things. Remember, God will bless you forever. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation about our words. I understand my words are carriers and are releasing things. They're an agent sent forth. They are doing something. Power is in the words. If I speak right words that are the word of God, 
God will be with my mouth and with the words that I speak and I'll release life. I confess a sin. All words that I have spoken that have not released life, that have not been in line with the Word of God, that have brought forth death and destruction and negativism. I am changing. I repent with a godly sorrow. And I make the decision. I'm correcting myself. I'm going to speak right words. I'm going to speak things in line with the Word. I'm going to put the Word of God in my mouth. I'll get it in my heart. Out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth will be speaking. And by my words, speaking right words, I'll be justified and right, declared righteous before God. I thank you that I purpose in my mouth, I shall not transgress. I am setting a watch, a guard, before my mouth. I understand the devil's trying to get to my mouth for me to speak wrong words. I will resist him. And every temptation, I will speak the answer. Speak the word of God. And I understand that just as Jesus was upholding and bringing into being all things by the spoken word, of his power, I will do the same. I will speak right words and I will bring into being all of the promises of God. I thank you that I am taking the new covenant into my mouth as I speak the word of God according to the new covenant. I thank you. I have the spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith and I am a believing one, and I am speaking, putting the word in operation, my faith going forth. The power of God in the word will bring the promises to pass. And I understand the partition, part participation of my faith, which becomes actively and effective and operating when I speak precise, correct knowledge of everything that belongs to me, all the promises, and I put them in operation. I am coming into Christ Jesus, possessing the promises and becoming a partaker of the divine nature. I thank you. I'm going to get the word in me and the spirit of God's going to speak by me because his word is going to be in my tongue. I thank you that I understand words that I've spoken that are wrong words. I can't take them back. They've been released and they can cause destruction. So I will cease to speak wrong words from this day forward. I understand my lips are not my own. Jesus bought the whole thing. My lips belong to the Lord. I make him Lord over my mouth. And I will speak right words. And as I speak right words and meet that condition, I can be like Samuel. None of his words fell to the ground. I thank you that my words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart is going to be acceptable in your sight. And I am going to do what is right in your sight. I will condemn every tongue that rises against me in judgment. I will not let the enemy be vexing my soul or breaking me in pieces with words anymore. I will not allow him to work against me, I will speak the word and extinguish every fiery dart. I thank you that I have the sword of the Spirit that will smite all enemies as I speak forth the word of God. And just as Jesus 
upheld all things and brought into being all things by the spoken word of God, I will do the same. I thank you. From this day forward, I'm going to speak the word of God. Thank you for accomplishing this great work in my life because I'm a hearer and a doer of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, thank you. Thank you for this life-changing message. Thank you that we're all going to take heed to it. And thank you for all that you're going to accomplish in every one of us and all of you out there as you're hearkening to it. We praise you for this tremendous work you're going to accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.